Hey there, and welcome to You Talk. We highlight stories of individuals across Canada and the diversity that can be found here. I'm your host, Ryan Funk. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Joss Reimer, medical lead and official spokesperson for Manitoba government's COVID-19 vaccine task force and medical officer of health for Manitoba Health and Seniors Care. She spoke at an online town hall organized by the Newcomer Vaccine Awareness Working Group and breaks down the latest information about the COVID-19 vaccination rollout and eligibility, debunks COVID-19 vaccination myths, and answers questions from various newcomers and newcomer organizations. This is the largest vaccine campaign that Manitoba has ever seen uh, in the history of this province. Um, The second largest was the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 and 2010, where we gave almost 700,000 doses of vaccine to people in Manitoba. But now we're talking about millions. And in fact, the number here is is out of date uh, because we've opened up to age, well, we will be opening up to age 12 and above. Uh, So we're talking about offering to a million Manitobans two doses of a vaccine. So a very different scope uh, compared to anything we've done in the past. And we are trying to use a science-based and evidence-based approach for every decision that we make. So we have a number of different groups that provide us with advice. We have a medical advisory table, which has over 30 physicians from immunology and infectious diseases and pediatrics, obstetrics, public health, that all uh, meet together with some pharmacists and nurses uh, to give us advice uh, on uh, how to use the vaccines, who to offer them on. So they tell us whether or not to use it in pregnancy, for example. Uh, and whether or when to time it for people who might be on certain medications. Uh, We also have an epidemiology and surveillance team. Uh, These are the experts who collect and interpret and communicate out data both around infections and the vaccine rollout uh, and help us understand what's happening in Manitoba there. Uh, We have medical officers of health. These are public health doctors who work in public health all the time. Uh, But now almost all of our work is focused on COVID and we meet many times a week uh, to come up with the population level advice uh, for both the vaccine as well as uh, responses to the virus. And then we meet with stakeholders and partners like you uh, because we want to understand how uh, people fit into our prioritization and what experiences people are having throughout Manitoba. So the next couple of slides, I'm just going to go through briefly just to cover a bit about what we know about how Black, Indigenous uh, and people of colour are being impacted by COVID compared to uh, other folks in Manitoba. So we've seen very clearly that BIPOC people are overrepresented in cases of COVID-19. In fact, over half of all of those people who have tested positive uh, from May 1st to December 31st, that's when our report was put together, Uh, identified as Black, Indigenous, or a person of colour. But this is uh, only 35% of people in Manitoba who actually belong to these groups. So you can see that that far greater than than the percentage that belong to the group are being uh, infected. Uh, And we saw numbers being particularly high in the Filipino community, as well as the South Asian communities, uh, on top of our First Nations uh, over-representation. Um, And so, you know, these are areas that uh, we very much want to focus on and ensure that we are prioritizing for vaccine because we've seen this higher um, burden of illness in those groups as well. Um, Next slide. And likewise, we've seen an overrepresentation of cases who work in food manufacturing, in the service industry and in transportation. And of course, we know that uh, folks who are Black, Indigenous, or people of color uh, work in these areas more than white individuals do. So a large percentage of these workforces are BIPOC communities. And so again, we see this over-representation happening in these groups. Next slide. So this is why we did a community-based approach. Uh, We wanted to give first access to people who lived in areas that were high risk for experiencing more infections and for being more likely to get really sick if they did get infected. So we looked at the populations uh, and picked priority communities 
based on how many BIPOC people lived in those communities. We looked at the income, we looked at the density of the population and the history of how many cases there had been. And that's how we chose those communities. Now, as of yesterday, uh, everybody 18 and over is now eligible. So regardless of whether or not you live in these communities, if you're an adult living in Manitoba, you don't have to be a citizen, you don't have to be a permanent resident, you just have to be living here. Uh, you are now eligible for a vaccine. And we're trying to reach people in a number of different ways. So you can book through our call center or the online system, uh, and you can book at any of our pop-ups or our super sites. We also have five urban indigenous clinics. Um, these were created in consultation with some indigenous led organizations, as well as some First Nations experts um, and are, are focused mostly on indigenous populations. Uh, we really are trying to reach out because we're seeing so many harms in that population. Uh, but these uh, five sites will be available on an ongoing basis. Next slide. So uh, overall, we've seen a good vaccine uptake uh, when we look at the population in Manitoba, particularly in the oldest uh, Manitobans where they've been eligible for a lot longer. So for example, Manitobans who are over 90, uh, or sorry, over 80, have had more than 90% uptake, which is fantastic. We don't see that level of uptake for almost anything in vaccine rollout. Um, now those numbers go down as we get younger, but that's to be expected because they haven't been eligible for as long. Um, but we have seen some patterns emerging where uh, both in Winnipeg and in Southern Manitoba, there are some areas that have lower uptake. And this is a blend of things. We think in Southern Manitoba, a lot of it has to do with uh, vaccine hesitancy, um, beliefs and community views on vaccine. But in Winnipeg, we think a lot more of it has to do with uh, barriers to seeking care, whether those are language, childcare, income, uh, not having sick time off of work, um, not being connected to reliable sources of information. Uh, and so uh, what we need to do is our next steps is to work on things like this, uh, where we're meeting with you to reach those communities. Next slide, please. Um, so that uh, we can get the information to you so that you can spread it to your communities and you can be that reliable voice uh, to the people uh, that you love and work with and uh, your other community members. Uh, we want to work with the ethno-cultural and newcomer serving organizations. We've been translating a number of our materials uh, into many different languages. We now have that if you call the booking line, you can ask for a phone interpreter to join the call uh, and we have hundreds of languages available. Uh, and so they'll get that third person on the call with you to assist you in booking your appointment. And then uh, they'll also help you book that same process so that there's a phone interpreter available at the super site when you go in the same hundreds of languages. Um, so you're certainly welcome to bring someone that can help interpret, but uh, at our super sites, uh, they all have it available by phone to have an interpreter there. Um, we're also doing some outreach to religious leaders and other community leaders in key regions, again, because I know that People listen to the people around them. They listen to their loved ones. They listen to their local uh, leaders who are respected in the community. And so we want to empower those individuals uh, to feel confident in the information uh, and to help them share uh, that information with their communities. We're doing some targeted advertising uh, as well as some uh, at the provincial level, as well as some community led initiatives to reach out to a lot of people. Um, but we need to uh, continually improve this. So we know that there's a lot more we could be doing uh, and we plan to keep improving and rolling out more and more as we go along. And so your feedback is always helpful uh, to help us figure out how we can best reduce barriers and reach more people. Okay, Dr. Reimer, uh, many of our ELS students in adult ed classes are asking if being vaccinated will become a requirement for classes in the fall and if non-vaccinated students should stay on online classes. 
Yeah, I mean, that one is not so much a question for me as it is for the, the folks that run the um, classes. The um, English as a, an additional language classes, um, each facility could make a decision on their own. I suspect most of them will not require vaccination in order to attend, but certainly at the provincial level, we're not planning to require vaccination in order to attend classes. Um, so that'll be something that uh, each facility will have to make decisions about how best to run their classes with a blend of in-person or um, online. Okay, thank you. Uh, you say that everyone in Manitoba has access to vaccines. However, when you are called, they ask for your health number. That's a, that's a great point. So uh, if you do have a Manitoba health card, um, that helps us because uh, we can we have you in the system and it's easy for us to uh, get uh, into your file and get everything organized, but it is not a requirement. So you will be asked if you have a Manitoba health number, but if you don't have one, they can still book you. You can still go and get a vaccine. Um, it's just much simpler for us from a, from a tracking and organization uh, perspective uh, to be able to uh, attach things to people's health card if they have them. But please uh, do still call and book and plan to get uh, a vaccine even if you don't have a Manitoba health number. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a hand raised by Dr. Denise Coe. It was really around... Um, like if there's access issues um, with the BIPOC community and there's a strong link with work li link with workplaces, I'm wondering more about um, when or how we're going to be able to open up the workplaces that are offering to do vaccine clinics for their racialized workers. So can you give us a little bit more as to what the status is there and how you know um, how we can get that going? Yeah, so I would say that there's ongoing work on that. Uh, and we've been talking to some of the workplaces um, right now with the pause in first dose for AstraZeneca, we have to shift our approach to be thinking about Pfizer and Moderna. So um, that work is happening now, but we do want to reach people as much as possible through many different mechanisms going forward. Uh, we started with uh, things like super sites because we wanted to get as many doses into people's arms as quickly as possible. But once we get most of those doses in, we can really focus a lot more of our energies on reaching people where the super site is not the ideal mechanism for them to be immunized. And workplaces is one of those ways that we'll look at that. Excellent, thank you. A uh, question came up, how much immunity do I have after seven days, 14 days, and 21 days after my first dose? Yeah, so most of the evidence uh, shows that after about 14 days is when your uh, immune system will hit its, uh, or at least close to the peak response um, or highest response to the vaccine. Uh, so by seven days, you will have some immunity, but really it's not until 14 days that we get to that high level. We've looked at a number of different studies and seen that it's probably somewhere around the realm of 80% uh, protection, meaning that about 80% of people will be immune to the virus after receiving one dose. Uh, the tricky part is that you don't know if you're part of the 80% who did develop that strong immune response, or if you're part of the 20% that didn't which is why it's still important until most of our community is immunized to be practicing public health measures like wearing masks and distancing. Um, and it's also important to get that second dose uh, because some of that 20% are gonna convert and become immune as well. And everybody is gonna benefit because it will lengthen the amount of time that you're immune so that we don't have to do all of this again in the fall with shutting everything down. Excellent, thank you. Uh, will medical workers have priority to getting second dose? Sort of. Um, so the first priority for second dose is going to be people who have health conditions that put them at risk of not being able to mount a strong immune response after only one dose. So this is, you know, people who have had a, a, an organ transplant, for example, and now they have to take medications that keep their immune system not very strong. Uh, so those people are going to get first access to the second dose. Uh, after them, 
It's going to be organized according to when you got your first dose. And healthcare providers uh, mostly were the first ones to receive their first dose. So they'll likely be eligible first just based on that timing. Um, but rather than going through and doing a whole other prioritization process like we did the first time, we're really just going to time it with the first dose. Uh, but it's going to be very fast. So all Manitobans uh, are going to have been made eligible to receive two doses by mid-July. So it's going to be much, much faster than the first round of doses was. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have been trying to get a vaccination confirmation for a person who does not have a medical health card, and it's been impossible because we are still being asked to give a medical health card number. How can, how can one get a confirmation for travel purposes? Yeah, so if you call the booking line, they, they should ask for the health number, but shouldn't require it. Um, and so certainly we would want to hear at the task force if they are uh, requiring it because they shouldn't be. To book online, I believe you do have to have a health number just because of how the booking system works, uh, but that shouldn't be the case through the call center. Um, so please do um, send an email to um, ask health if you are finding that you're not able to book people. Um, as far as getting evidence of immunization, uh, for, to use the online portal, again, you do have to have a Manitoba Health number. Uh, if you have a health number, you can go online and you can print off uh, your vaccine record uh, for COVID from the online site. Um, now, if you don't have a health card, you can still call your local public health office and they can print it off for you and give you that record from there. Again, it's just a limitation in the way the online system works that it's attached to the health number, but you can get it printed from your local public health office. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great there is, a, there is language access. However, is there a way to fine tune the access to interpreters when using the call center? Yeah, that's great feedback. And I will provide that feedback to the, the call center because if there's a way they can make it easier uh, for people, then we want them to do that. So I will let them know that, you know, it might be helpful right from the beginning to say, um, do you want English, French or an interpreter? And, and, and we'll see if they can put that in right at the beginning. Okay, next question. Uh, there is research coming out stating after one year, third dose will be required. Had the province begun planning this to date? Yeah, we're certainly still hoping that that won't be the case. Uh, but as this virus keeps changing, um, it's possible that it'll change in the future in a way that makes the vaccines that we have now not uh, useful long term. So we are planning uh, to be able to provide a third dose and potentially even an annual dose, um, even though we hope that won't be what happens. Um, so we are looking at um, providing uh, through a variety of mechanisms where we can hopefully take advantage of the doctor's offices, the pharmacies, and the public health systems that we had in place before COVID, um, and then enhancing them to be able to offer this if it's needed on an annual basis through our usual mechanisms, but enhanced with some additional um, uh, human resources, additional people, additional locations uh, to make it even easier if we have to keep doing this. Okay, uh, a couple questions that came in from uh, the newcomers group, wondering if they get the vaccine, will I get really sick or could I die from the vaccine? So most people don't get very sick after getting the vaccine. So it's, uh, most people will have a sore arm. That's very common. Some people, a, uh, a small number of people will feel unwell after the vaccine. So they might feel tired or feel like they have a fever, um, which is sometimes the way our immune system reacts when it, it thinks the virus is there, which is what the, the vaccine is supposed to do is, is make your immune system think that the virus is there so it can start to develop a, a response. Uh, so some people will feel unwell for a few days. Um, most people don't. Um, and almost nobody has severe uh, outcomes uh, and uh, we haven't, uh, apart from, uh, I'll talk about AstraZeneca in a second, 
but we haven't had any clear um, deaths related to the vaccine uh, in Canada at all. Um, we, you know, the only people that we have heard about are those people who had an unrelated issue. So for example, we had someone in Manitoba who uh, had a heart attack after getting the vaccine, but they had had heart attacks in the past. They had lots of risk factors for having heart attacks. So it wasn't the vaccine that led to their death. It was the fact that they already had heart disease uh, before, including previous heart attacks before they got the vaccine. Now with AstraZeneca, there is about a one in a hundred thousand risk of getting a blood clot uh, along with some low platelets. That's not happening with Pfizer and Moderna. It really just seems to be AstraZeneca. Most of those people also don't die, um, but uh, that risk is very, very low, but not zero with that vaccine, um, which is one of the reasons, certainly not the only reason, that we have paused offering it as a first dose uh, if people can get Pfizer or Moderna instead. So if you're able to go to a super site or a pop-up, uh, then we would recommend that you get Pfizer or Moderna at one of those sites uh, for your first dose instead of AstraZeneca for now, just because of that slight increased risk uh, associated with the blood clots that we have not seen with the other vaccines. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, will there be relaxed public health measures for people fully vaccinated? Yeah, so the government's talking about two separate approaches. One is uh, looking at the population as a whole, and the goal absolutely of the vaccine campaign is to relax those public health restrictions for all of us. That's what we want. Uh, we would like to get back to something closer to normal, um, where people can see their loved ones, where they can work and play sports and socialize in ways that are much closer to normal. Uh, and we just need enough people vaccinated to be able to do that. The government is also looking at some of the individual things that might change, and they haven't made a lot of decisions yet about what, uh, what that might mean for the individuals who are fully vaccinated. Um, I expect, and then we've already seen with many countries that there are travel restrictions uh, that require you to be immunized before you go to certain countries. So that already is happening in other countries. Uh, and there might be other things that happen here as well, but they haven't made any final decisions. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Uh, next question, is there any information being gathered on how many Manitoban or how many Manitobans being vaccinated are newcomers to Canada? And what has the province been recommending to newcomer support groups it has been connecting with? Yeah, so we have been trying to collect uh, the um, race, ethnicity, and Indigenous identifiers related to vaccines as well. It's proving very logistically challenging uh, because of the high volume uh, of data collection that it is. So we're still trying to work on that and see if we can get that in place, um, but we don't have it yet. Um, so what we can use for estimates is looking at, uh, we know uh, approximate for different postal codes, we know uh, the racial makeup of different postal codes, and we can potentially do some estimates based on uh, people's postal codes. Now, none of this breaks it up by newcomer versus uh, not newcomer. The only thing we could potentially do there is looking at whether or not people have a Manitoba health card. Um, and we might be able to report based on that, but we don't have uh, clear data on that yet. Um, and as far as uh, what we're recommending for newcomer organizations uh, is we're really asking uh, for your help to reach the people that you work with, um, to provide them with resources and information and knowledge to boost their confidence in the vaccine uh, and help them get access to reliable information because we want to protect them as much as everybody else in Manitoba. We all uh, want to save lives and uh, prevent illness. So uh, you know, whatever we can do with you to reach them better, uh, we want to do. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, if someone does not have a health care card, booking a vaccine appointment via phone, 
What information do they need to provide other than the basics like their name? I asked when I called in for my own vaccine appointment and the answer was unclear, but they implied they would need some sort of papers or forms or some form of identification. So they, they'll definitely ask you for your date of birth, uh, you know, your name, your address, uh, because they do need some way to make sure that uh, we're only giving one dose to everybody or eventually two doses to everybody. And that we, for dose two, that we know who got what dose uh, in the first place so that you don't get the wrong product um, or other things like that. Um, so none of those questions are meant to be a limitation to your access. They're more a way for us to know that you got the vaccine and so that we can provide you with uh, the right second dose, not provide you with uh, too many doses, all of those kinds of things. Um, if you can provide uh, a Manitoba health card or a government ID uh, when you're at the clinic, that makes things the easiest, but it's not required. So um, the second best, if you can't do a government issued ID would be any form of identification, but even that is not required. Uh, so if you don't have that, um, if you can bring even like uh, some sort of a bill or something that shows where you live, that's your third best option, still not required. Uh, so if you have nothing showing your identification, but you can tell us your address, your date of birth, your name in a way that we can figure out who you are in the system, that's the only requirement is that we can somehow identify who you are uh, in the system, but you are not required to show any particular form of ID, uh, but it does make it certainly easier uh, if you do have uh, identification. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I know there are vaccinations for people under 18 that are given in schools, which is a great way to reach the population quickly, and there may be hard to reach with this coming summer. Is your team considering going into schools with the COVID vaccine? So we are absolutely considering it. We're not gonna be able to do it this school year for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was that uh, the approval from Health Canada to include youth uh, surprised us and came a lot sooner than we were expecting. So we hadn't uh, been working on the school-based system because we were told that approval really wasn't gonna happen this school year. Um, the second issue is that uh, in Winnipeg and Brandon, uh, almost all students are on remote learning right now. So they're not in the schools. Uh, and even outside of the, those two cities, many of the schools are on remote learning. So we can't reach most students that way right now. Um, but when it comes to the fall and kids are back in school, we are uh, absolutely looking at that, as well as the fact that we're behind on our usual school-based vaccines. So we need to figure out how we're gonna catch up on that as well. So uh, no final plans yet, but it is absolutely one of the things that we are considering. Okay, thank you. Uh, will Shared Health and WH, or WRHA look at strengthening the relationships with service providers moving forward to combat more health concerns that have proven to be precursors of worse outcomes once an individual is diagnosed with COVID-19, such as obesity, diabetes, tuberculosis, etc.? I mean, I think we always have a lot of room to improve on, on prevention. That public health, uh, that's our, our bread and butter is, is trying to prevent uh, health outcomes, whether they're COVID or anything else. Um, so that's absolutely our goal is to get better and better at working with service providers, at working with community organizations, at working with individuals, uh, municipalities to try to improve the health of everyone in Manitoba, and we will keep uh, working on that as we go forward. Thank you. Are there any plans to do pop-up clinics or fit teams to do vaccination clinics at the ethnocultural community centers? A coordinator approach here would help eliminate some of the difficulties and barriers we are seeing with booking through the SuperSite system. So we, uh, like I said, we're starting with the uh, most efficient, so the fastest ways to get people through uh, because we wanted to try to get as much immunity into Manitoba as possible to help decrease the uh, third wave because the more of us that are protected, the more it helps even those who haven't received the vaccine yet. 
Uh, but we're now getting into the planning on how to reach people who were not well served by those sites uh, and uh, looking at a number of different mechanisms to provide vaccine in many different locations. So we have talked about places like ethnocultural community centers or specific churches, um, and we'll keep talking about that. When minors start getting their vaccine, will their parents be required to go with them to the vaccine super site or can they go on their own? I am thinking of those who have their license and can go on their own. That is a great question. Um, so for 16 and 17 year olds, um, unless uh, there's something that the clinician at the site has a specific concern about, they uh, can go on their own, they can book on their own, they can sign their own consent form, uh, and they can get the vaccine without anybody uh, joining them or giving permission on their behalf. Uh, for someone who is 12 to 15, uh, ideally, we would either have their parent or guardian present with them at the clinic, or we'd like them to sign the consent form ahead of time and send the, the child with that signed consent form with the parent or guardian having already signed that consent form. Um, but if uh, the, a 12 to 15 year old does come to the clinic without uh, a parent or guardian and without a signed consent form, we have a process at the clinic where they'll go and talk to one of our nurses or our doctors so that they can do a one-on-one -on -one assessment uh, to determine if that individual has the ability to understand all of the risks and benefits of the vaccine, of the of COVID uh, illness. Uh, and if they determine that the youth does understand all the components of this decision, they uh, can be considered what we call a mature minor. And then they can consent uh, for their own vaccine without uh, the permission of a parent or guardian. But certainly we prefer that the parent or guardian, guardian either be present uh, or have provided that consent ahead of time. And we will try to uh, phone them uh, at the clinic if say you know, a 13 year old comes without uh, that uh, ready. But, but we do have this backup process uh, for kids who do clearly understand the risks and benefits. Thank you very much. Uh, our sense that our sense right now is that COVID cases are rising in newcomer communities rapidly. Lots of families attending online programs are sick. It feels very urgent to create pop-up, low barrier sites at community locations sooner than later. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're seeing lots of cases all over and we feel that sense of urgency as well. And so our, our teams are, are very much looking at uh, how to reach so many different communities um, but I, I think there's lots of room for improvement and uh, developing these low barrier sites uh, is, is an urgent uh, thing from our perspective as well. And, and I know that the operations team is, is working on it. Thank you. Are there plans to provide language interpreters at pop-up and drop-in sites? I believe now, maybe I'll have to double check with some of the, the folks that run the pop-up sites, but I believe they can also use the phone interpreter service as well. Um, but I will take that away to uh, make sure that that is accurate and ask them to communicate back with this group. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, if someone has had COVID-19 recently, do they need to wait a certain amount of time before getting their vaccine? So we had been uh, suggesting that people wait three months after their infection before getting the vaccine. Now that was largely because of supply. Um, you know, when people have had the infection, almost everybody will be immune to the virus for some amount of time, but certainly three months uh, seems uh, the minimum that people are immune. Um, and so we wanted to give the vaccine to someone with no immunity before giving it to somebody who's probably immune already. As this supply has really increased and we're now open to all adults in Manitoba, that three month wait becomes less important um, so you still don't need to rush uh, if you've had a recent infection that you know for sure was COVID. Uh, so you've been tested and confirmed to have COVID. Uh, so you don't need to rush. You probably are still protected for a little while, um, but you also don't need to worry so much about uh, waiting for other people to get access first because we have 100,000 doses coming in every week. Um, so you can go ahead and book whenever it works best for you. Thank you. Uh, next question. 
what kind of recovery planning is underway, how can we build upon these relationships begun and facilitate a role for newcomer organizations to build back with an invitational focus on detriments of health inequity? Yeah, so I mean, that's a much bigger question than I'm able to answer on this uh, discussion. This is uh, ongoing work that the health equity team uh, at the province and at the regional level uh, works on all the time and uh, will continue to work on uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, next question that was submitted, will the vaccine affect my ability for me to have children? Oh, that's a great question. So I've heard this myth a number of times that people are really worried that it's going to impact fertility or the ability to get pregnant uh, or even if, uh, you know, to, to have children more generally. And we have not seen that come up anywhere in any country. Um, nobody is reporting any problems with uh, the ability to have children related to this vaccine. So uh, I, I don't actually know where the myth came from in the first place. But uh, we have not seen that in the trials. We have not seen that in Canada. Uh, and we haven't seen it in any other country, even though we've given out you know, hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine around the world. Nobody is reporting any problems with fertility related to these vaccines. So it's been very uh, reassuring that uh, this is not going to have any negative impact on that. Um, and so we really want people to get the vaccine so that they're not at risk of getting severely ill with the virus, which can have all sorts of long-term consequences if you have an infection. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Reimer. Uh, next question, there is a lot of fear hesitation fueled by conspiracy theories. What is the best way to assure newcomer communities those, se those social network goes beyond Winnipeg that the vaccine is safe and is not attached to an evil plan that harms humanity. Yeah, and that's so hard. I know that WhatsApp has been a big source of misinformation. Um, and so it's it's a huge challenge for us. Um, you know, it's uh, the first thing I would say is that, you know, there's no way that our governments are organized enough to be able to work together throughout the whole world and come up with uh, a plan together to harm humanity without anybody uh, like spilling the beans that this is what we're doing. We're just, there's just no way we could ever do that. Um, but that aside, the fact that we, we couldn't even organize something like that, um, you know, why we don't want, why would the governments want to do that? Uh, you know, we want what's best for Canadians, what's best for um, everyone who's in Manitoba. Uh, and everybody in public health went into it because they care about the health of their communities. And so, you know, our, our number one goal is to uh, have a healthy community. And so we've looked at the science. Um, you know, I have looked at the studies and uh, seen that the vaccine is safe uh, and is a way to protect people, not to harm people. So, you know, it's, you, I, you've all seen it. It's challenging. Uh, all over the place. I have uh, friends and family as well who, who worry about some of these um, you know, myths that are circulating. And so uh, it's something that we're gonna have to be working on for a long time uh, to help people feel confident that uh, this vaccine is in their best interest. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. How can organizations help reduce vaccine hesitancy, especially for groups where getting the vaccine wasn't a common thing in their home country? Should we record or take pictures when we get our vaccine to share with others to show that it's safe? Yeah, I think there's a lot of really great things that uh, newcomer organizations can do because you are uh, very trusted with these communities. And so uh, being able to demonstrate uh, if you had the vaccine uh, that uh, you're doing well, uh, can make a huge impact on somebody more than me sharing numbers ever could. Um, so being the, those examples uh, and those leaders for your community uh, is so important to being able to reach people and help them feel comfortable in the approach. And also having, if you have access to reliable information and can provide that, uh, I, you, know, you are also seen as leaders for that sort of thing in these communities. And so 
that that can be incredibly helpful. Um, and helping to spread, you know, if we have materials in many languages, uh, we do really rely on the community organizations to distribute those materials uh, because you know, we don't have direct contact with everybody in Manitoba. So taking advantage of the, the relationships that you already have developed over so many years of work um, will make a huge difference in people uh, feeling trust in the, the system if they know that the people who have cared for them up until this point uh, trust in the system as well. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Uh, will the minimum age go down to six years or younger for vaccination? Uh, so I, all I can say to that is probably. Um, Pfizer is running a trial right now for people younger than 12. Uh, I believe that they are even going as young as six months, not six years, um, but they haven't completed it. So I, you know, I would guess uh, that they're likely going to have good results because it's, uh, you know, we see good immune response for children for many other vaccines. So I would be surprised if uh, this one didn't show similar benefit, um, but we haven't seen the results yet. So um, I would say stay tuned uh, and uh, we'll see what the manufacturers find when they do uh, study this in younger populations. Thank you very much. Uh, what challenges do, are you seeing in the immigration population? What steps would you recommend to be the most effective in increasing vaccination confidence in the immigrant population? I think there's a lot of challenges in, in uh, newcomer populations. Um, so certainly language barriers are, are a big issue. If all the materials are available in English and French, that, that may not serve many people. So we are uh, trying to work at translating a number of our materials to be available um, and even to create uh, videos in multiple languages. Um, that can be very helpful to people as well, uh, as opposed to just having something to read. Um, I know a lot of new immigrants also face challenges related to uh, their workplace. Uh, in, new immigrants are more likely to not have uh, sick time. Uh, and so it can be challenging to get both childcare and time off work to be able to go for a vaccine, even if they really want to do that. Um, and then we've already talked about a lot of the, the myths that have been circulating. And uh, we heard, we've heard a lot from some of the uh, members of the South Asian community about the, the conspiracy uh, theories that they're seeing on WhatsApp, for example. Um, and those are very challenging to combat uh, because they are coming from uh, networks that these people uh, are engaged in all the time. Um, and so we need to be doing a lot of different things at the same time and recognizing that this is going to be a, a longer road than just uh, sharing on our website that uh, this is a safe and effective vaccine. So we're going to continue to develop materials. We're going to continue to work with uh, community organizations and, and try to expand uh, how we connect with the organizations. We're going to uh, set up uh, pop-up sites in convenient and trusted locations for people in the future. Um, and we're going to uh, try to keep uh, and expand our connections with local leaders, uh, whether they're uh, community leaders or religious leaders, uh, to arm them with the, the best possible information to share with their communities. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Uh, this will probably be our last question. If the COVID-19 vaccine dose becomes an annual thing, what will public health do to ensure the large amounts of Manitobans get it, especially since the vast majority don't get the flu shot? Yeah, and, and we're gonna have to face that, that challenge for sure. Uh, you know, we typically see um, about a third of Manitobans get the flu shot, uh, and we wanna go much higher than that for uh, COVID. Um, so some of the things we're going to do is, is ensuring that it's in convenient locations uh, at convenient times. Uh, we're going to be uh, enhancing our existing infrastructure to be able to uh, reach people in schools, in potentially workplaces, in a lot of different ways. Uh, but this is something that public health is going to have to be working on if we have to do this. Um, uh, we're going to have to be working on for years to come to ensure that everyone in Manitoba uh, sees the benefit of uh, getting the vaccine. You can call to make a vaccine appointment at 
8222. You can also book an appointment online, along with reading some COVID-19 resources. The phone number and links are available in the information of this episode. If you have any stories you'd like us to share or communities we should highlight, leave a comment on our social media or reach out to us on our website. I'm Ryan Funk. This was You Talk, and have yourself a good one.